Hi, this is Sarah Barnes from Taming Twins, and you are listening to the Eat Blog Talk podcast. Hey, awesome food bloggers. Before we dig into this episode, I have a really quick favor to ask you. Go to your favorite podcast player, go to Eat Blog Talk, scroll down to the bottom where you see the ratings and review section. Leave Eat Blog Talk a five-star rating if you love this podcast and leave a great review. This will only benefit this podcast. It adds value. And I so very much appreciate your efforts with this. Thank you so much for doing this. Okay, now on to the episode. Hey there, food bloggers. Welcome to eBlog Talk, the podcast for food bloggers looking for the value and confidence that will move the needle forward in their businesses. This episode is sponsored by Rank IQ. I'm your host, Megan Porta, and you're listening to episode number 333. Today, I have Sarah Barnes with me. She's going to tell us about how she grew 78,000 Instagram followers and 130,000 TikTok followers in 90 days in a soulful way. Sarah is a food blogger who is also a mom to 10-year-old twins. Working and juggling young children, she's forever struggled with the everyday what's for dinner question. She now helps other busy people find their answer. Her blog has 8 million views a year, and she has a combined social following of over 800,000 people, probably more by the time we're talking, right, Sarah? Yes, yeah. Yeah, well, it's so great to have you here. How are you doing today, Sarah? I'm good. I'm really excited to chat. Me too. I was just telling you before recording that I just started a TikTok account like last week, and I have I don't know where this came from because all year I've been like, no, I refuse to do TikTok. Absolutely not. And then it something got you in the end. <laughs> changed in me. Well, I know exactly what it was. Some I heard someone talk that just presented TikTok in a new way. Yeah. And I was like, I have to do this. I just know I did. So Instagram as well. You're going to teach us all we need to know about how to grow quickly. Before we get into that, though, what is your fun fact? I listen to your podcast all the time and I listen to these facts and I thought about mine today coming on and I thought, oh, this is really vulnerable. Then I I thought about Brene Brown and what she would say and I thought, no, Uh, this is how we make the best connections. Yes. So my fun fact is that I learned to ride a bike when I was 32. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I just never, I was never interested when I was a child. And then my children were learning to ride a bike. And I thought, no, I've got to sort this out. And I went and had like adult learn to ride a bike lessons. Oh my gosh. Okay. First of all, nice job being vulnerable. I think (laughs) Brene would be very proud of you. Secondly, within, I would say like within 10 interviews ago, another person had this fun fact. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah. So you and her need to talk. I can't remember who it was. I need to bond over it with somebody. (laughs) Yeah, that's so crazy. And then I told her, I'm going to tell you what I told her, which is my 15-year-old son has just not been able to ride a bike. It's been such a hard, it's such a struggle. And finally last year, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to fight this fight anymore. Someday he will do it. And it's just not going to be an issue for me right now. I think I was I was like more proud of myself than yeah. even my children were proud of themselves. <laughs> right. they were like, oh. <laughs> exactly. I was just going to say that. So it'll be more of an accomplishment yeah. down the road. So I really appreciate you sharing this. Thank you, Sarah. And I'm glad that you learned. So are you like a confident bike rider now? Or are you still kind of... Absolutely kinda... not. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're like, I can do it and that's good enough. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could wheel it out, excuse the pun, if I needed to. <laughs> I'm pleased I've done it, put it that way, but I'm not regular. (laughs) Maybe one day, maybe one day. (laughs) Good for you. Good for you. Okay. I am super excited. I know I say that on every episode, but today I'm really, really excited (laughs) to learn from you about Instagram and TikTok because that growth is incredible. I mean, we just can't argue with those numbers. So why did you decide to change your approach to Instagram and TikTok and talk through what that approach was? So I've been blogging since 2013 and for a long time a lot of my traffic came from Pinterest and I mean it's obviously talked about a lot in the food blogger world at the moment but there's been a massive or for most people there's been a massive downturn in traffic from Pinterest and the same thing happened to me and I was really feeling the pinch on that and you know what it's like you try different things and you try different approaches and I kept trying and trying with Pinterest and in the end I just thought at at some point I've got to change my approach overall here and I started uh, I started watching TikTok and using TikTok and something kind of 
captured my interest because it is ridiculously addictive. And I guess I felt, you know, if everyone else is being addicted to TikTok, then I should be on there as well. And I'd always had an Instagram account, but I'd never really focused on it. And so at the end of last year, kind of coming up to Christmas, I thought actually fresh start January, I was really fed up with Pinterest and trying to make it work for me. And I just thought I need to kind of put that energy somewhere else. And I would have a go Instagram and TikTok. And I told myself that I would really throw myself into it for six months and kind of almost at the cost of my my time spent on my blog. But I, I felt like I needed to give it six months and see if it worked. And spoiler, it has. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a good choice. Okay. So that's interesting that Pinterest was kind of the catalyst to like, okay, I need to figure yeah. something else out. I think we're all feeling that right now. And you did, you dug in and you figured it out, obviously, amazingly. So share with us maybe like what your first insights were and what did you change first? So obviously, so as I said, I've been doing this since 2013, the blog, and I think I probably had an Instagram account about from about the same time. And, you know, we all read these articles, don't we, that tell us how to get more followers or how to kind of play the algorithm. And I spent you know, years thinking about that and thinking, oh, I need a, f- I don't know. If you've been food blogging for a while, there's always different trends, aren't there? So I'd think, oh, I need to do all photos with white backgrounds or I need to, you know, show my handwriting or there'd be all my hands. There'd be something that you would think this is going to make me win Instagram. And it never did, which is very frustrating. So I got to Christmas and I did something which I hadn't done in the past, which is I asked my audience what they wanted. So I put a question on my Instagram stories and I really talked to them and I talked to Instagram stories and I'll talk about this a bit more later, but I speak to my audience all the time, really directly as if, you know, well, they are my friends, (laughs) but I speak to them like I would speak to a friend who's in the same room. And I was just really honest and said, like, what, what do you want? What can I do? What are your struggles? And I found this amazing thing, which is that when people are struggling, they really want to talk about Mm. it. And so I I basically had a total shift from what do I need to do to win this algorithm thing to what can I do to be helpful and how can I be supremely helpful at all times on this platform? And generally, it just totally changed my mindset because I shifted from what, what do I want to do or give or make to what is going to be the most useful yeah, and that was my main mindset change for the start of the year. So what did you find people were telling you? What did they what were they struggling with? There was pat- there's always patterns I find which it probably is fairly common but there are some items which are specific to my audience who tend to be busy parents, not always but often families and parents who are very who are busy working and juggling things. So they talk a lot about time, the time after work to cook but it's not only the time to cook it's the time to think about food so the time to plan what they're going to eat to think about what ingredients are needed to just think about all of the things that go to contribute towards creating dinner in the evening it made me start to think about the mental load that cooking dinner has on us every night. You know, on a Sunday, you think, oh my goodness, what are we having for dinner this week? That just really inspired me to change my content up in yeah. line with those needs. So how did you take that specific problem? So time thinking about food was a pain point for your audience. How did you take that and turn it into content on Instagram and TikTok? Well, I kind of turned everything I did on my head, on its head. Yeah. <laughs> which was- which was a leap of faith, but I before I I used to produce quite a lot of cakes and sweet treat recipes, not exclusively, but I did quite a lot of that. And I just thought that's all really nice, but that is not serving my audience. Mm. That's not actually solving a problem for them. And I, I don't know. As I get older, possibly, I think there's something really meaningful to doing work that actually helps people. I, I know I'm not changing the world or anything, but just to be able to create create things that are actually going to help people felt very meaningful. So I thought, yeah, I just need to take a total leap of faith, change my content, really commit to this. So I did that by, as I say, changing my recipes. So they were much more heavily focused on dinners. So they were all reasonably quick, so that they were 
affordable as well so that I could demonstrate them and convey them in a really effective way so for me that was creating reels and obviously that's you know Instagram is video first now and everybody loves video on Instagram so we're told and I think they I do agree with that so yeah just creating really accessible reels to convey those those recipes and messages were the route I decided to take which was actually a bit of a shift for me because I had always made vid- oh, not always but in the recent years I've made videos but in a very different style in that kind of I was trying to make them professional whether they were or not I don't know but you know that kind of hands in pans like really clean yeah like video and edited in a slightly different way so I tried to make those reels a lot tighter and shorter so that people like within 15 or 20 seconds could see a recipe and think oh my goodness I could do this and I can do it after work so that allowed me to kind of convey that message hopefully So I've noticed this trend too on both platforms. Things are really condensing. So you have to get your point across or your, whatever you're solving, whatever solution you're solving, you have to do that in a really short time frame. Otherwise Mm. people are just gone, right? So 15 to 20 seconds is kind of what you recommend or does it depend? I think it depends on the recipe. I'm more intent and intentional about how I edit the videos So I think it's less about the total time and more about the pace of the video. So I'm when I edit the videos now, and I'd never done this before, and it felt a little bit unnatural at first, but what's happened over the last few months is they've got even like tighter and tighter. So when I edit the videos, sorry, this is like into my nitty gritty. I don't know whether you want this. No, that's good. (laughs) Let's go. We're rolling with it. But actually, I think this is this has actually been quite key for me, I think, which is to learn the videos that work. And for me. And I can't, you know, I can't say this is to everybody, but just from what I watch on TikTok and Instagram is to edit them in a really tight way. And by that, I mean, each clip of each shot would probably be one second or less. And I feel like that is the pace of the video, which keeps people interested. So I think it's important to have a distinction between the fact that this isn't an instructional video. This is somewhere between inspiration and entertainment and so it doesn't need to cover every single item or every single process that's shown in the video but what it does need to do is make someone want to click through to my blog and make the recipe yeah and that is a very different way of editing for me I start in about in January when I started making the reels I'd probably clip each clip to about two seconds and between January and now, they've just got tighter and tighter <laughs> because mm. I just feel like that's what people respond to. Yeah. I'm hoping they don't get any shorter than that. Because yeah, that's right. Very tricky to edit. <laughs> so you just started with something that you had in your mind, like, okay, this could work. I'm solving a problem. And then you saw what worked from what you put out there and you just tweaked it as you went. Yeah. And again, just listening to my audience as well. So I started, I think in maybe January and February, I did lots of recipes that I just put on Instagram because in the past, these kind of, you know, how to grow on Instagram, what does the algorithm like said that you need to keep people on the platform. So I experimented with, and I know lots of people do this and, you know, it might work for other people, but I I experimented with putting the recipes in the captions on Instagram. Okay. Then I went back to my audience. So I did this for like a few weeks and I went back to my audience and said, what, you know, what do you think about this? And two things happened. I found two interesting answers. One was they said they didn't like it because they wanted to be able to search my blog and they wanted to be able to find older content and they wanted to be able to think, oh, I want to make this salad. So I don't. they didn't want to scroll through my profile. So that was interesting. And the other thing that happened was I spoke to, <laughs> on, on Instagram stories, I explained the question a bit more. So I went back and I said, look, the reason I'm asking this question is because I don't know whether you know this, but I make my income and my living through ad revenue on my website. So I said, this is how I explained it to my audience, I'm really happy to put recipes on Instagram, but I can't do that exclusively because I do also need to, you know, pay my bills. And it was so interesting because my audience were just so, so wonderful they I had so many messages saying I didn't know this I can't believe it we love your recipes I'm going to click through all the time now 
that was a really interesting thing to discover. So because of that, I now don't put generally if it's something that's going to be on the blog or is suitable for the blog or I've taken photographs, it will go on the blog. There's, I mean, on occasion, there's things I haven't had time to take photos of and it goes on Instagram. But I wouldn't have known any of that if I hadn't spoken to my audience. And I think of everything that I've learned, that's like a really good takeaway, which is to talk to your followers and listen to them. Because aside from shaping everything I do now, it also it's I mean, if when I'm in an audience, it make it feels really good to be valued, doesn't it? So Mm. it's like a win win, I think. Yeah. Yeah. The talking to your audience, I think, is the easy part for a lot of us. It's actually like listening and following through. I've had that (laughs) problem. So like I'll be like, oh, I actually sent out a survey and I pulled my audience on Instagram. Like, good for you. But did you actually follow through? No. (laughs) So I think that's the key. Like, listen, what are they saying? And then figure out how to actually help them. Do you think maybe sometimes that's because it's like too much information? Yeah. Oh, definitely. (laughs) It is because especially if it comes to you in the form of a survey, like let's say Airtable, they create this handy little spreadsheet with all the information. You look at it and you're like, what am I supposed to do with all of this? This is way too much information. So then you just close it and like, well, now you just wasted everyone's time. (laughs) Yeah. And it's, it can be overwhelming. I, even now I do find that. So yesterday or maybe the day before I went back to my audience and asked and said, I'm planning my content in, over the summer. What are you struggling with? What can I help? And like you said, I had that thousands of responses and it is really overwhelming. I guess my suggestion and what works for me is I set aside some time to really absorb that. So I will kind of like, not when I'm busy, I will I will try and set aside a morning or something to really look at those responses, skim through them all and just get kind of a general feel Mm. for things. Pull out themes. Yeah, Yeah. pull out a pattern and stuff. And also I think it's important to know what feels right to you. It's important to use your own kind of gut instinct as well. So if, you know, people maybe ask me for like sugar-free recipes or dairy free and I try and give adaption stuff but that's never going to be my main blog because it just doesn't fit with my life and my lifestyle really so I think you do need and you know if I was vegan I wouldn't be writing a blog with lots of meat recipes in I think you do you have to take all of those answers and kind of absorb them and then find a place that feels comfortable for you as well that's my suggestion that's great advice. That was very well said. It's and not scientific. <laughs> no, you said that way better than I could have said that. But yeah, that was great. Okay, so you took, you decided to do this. You just knew you needed to dig in to Instagram and TikTok in a new way. You kind of figured out how to go about that. You took the sleep of faith and you invested your time into these platforms and money probably too. So what did that entail? I mean, did it require how much time a week, I guess, and how much of your energy. Talk us through that. Can I just say, when you said there that I knew I needed to do it, that you made me sound very organized. And like, (laughs) (laughs) it wasn't quite like that. I just feel like I need to set expectations. (laughs) I just, I, because I I think it's really easy to think, I should have a plan. I should know exactly what I should be doing. And it wasn't like that. Mm. I, I was feeling a bit desperate, if I'm honest, because my traffic from Pinterest was important to me. Yeah. And I had to do something. So it was like, I've got, I've got to, I've basically got to try this. So I get, the reason I think it's important to say that is I don't, I don't think, you know, with a blog, there's always more you could be doing, isn't there? And yes. it can be really overwhelming. And that's exactly how I felt when I started this. So it's, it's not like everybody else has got an amazing plan. And <laughs> yeah, <you know. laughs> sometimes it does just fall into your lap, new things, you know, you just know you need to do them. So however it came to you, you just, yeah, you, you exactly. needed to move forward with it. Right. Yeah. But yeah. I wasn't organized. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't a, literally a leap of faith. So I would really like to tell you that it was easy and I just slotted it in, but it wasn't. It's, it's actually, it has been really hard. I've upped my working hours. I've worked a lot of evenings, but 
I would say the more you do this type of video and this type of content, it gets so much quicker, Mm -hmm. very quickly. So at the moment, I'm putting a new piece of content out, so a new video on TikTok and Instagram almost every day. And I've just, I've found ways of editing. So I just literally edit on my phone. I use an app called InShot, which maybe I don't know. I love InShot. I just started using it. It's It's so so easy. It's so great. And so like when I'm on a train or a passenger in the car or something, I will just edit. And so I've I've basically found pockets of extra time to make this work. But now it's paying off. And so now I've taken on an extra VA to help me with comments and things and and to keep on top of like scheduling posts and stuff. And so that's made it easier. And that is obviously a leap of faith. But I've, I've started to see a return. I guess what I'm saying is I'm really happy that I said I'm going to make this commitment for six months. Mm-hmm. And in actual fact, it was probably three months until it started like paying for itself. But those, those three months weren't easy. I did work really hard. Yeah. I did work really hard. But 100% worth it because the return I've seen on that is massive. What is the return you've seen? What would you say? Well, my traffic has increased enormously. It's it's definitely made up for... It's hard to say right now because I get quite a lot of seasonal traffic at Easter, which was very high. But say I was getting... Say this time last year, I was getting... 12,000 page views a day, 15,000 page views a day on the blog. I'm now getting like 45,000 a day. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's also hard to tell from your analytics because a lot of it will look like it's direct traffic. But that, I think that is because people see a recipe on social and then they go and make it, you know, a week later and then they Google for it as well. So, I mean, I, I really feel like that is a benefit of all of this because the timeline is very it matches up to the timeline of my of really big growth so yeah so that's been really positive and also I just think I mean we all have patterns don't we and and when you've been blogging for a a while you have times where it feels really successful and times when it really doesn't and you feel like everything oh there'll be a google update like recently or there'll be ups and downs to it and it can be really disheartening and I've been through that lots of times and when things are going well and you feel like you're creating good content that is actually meaningful to people it just it's it feels really good. <laughs> it yeah. feels really good. So as well as having a financial gain, it's just generally been a really positive experience to me to create content that people are finding really, really useful. Oh, and, I love that. Yeah. And that's lovely messages from people about how how just how the how my content is making their life a bit easier. And yeah, I keep all of those messages in a folder so that when I am having a bad day or the video I'm making hasn't worked or something, yeah. I go and look at those messages and I think, no, this is why I took that leap of faith. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you mentioned that. I started doing that as well and it's been a game changer for me. Just taking mm. every single email or message that I get that's like, you know, positive or like yeah. you inspire me or whatever, I copy and paste it into a document on Google Drive and it's in a folder called awesomeness and I open that occasionally because I do have those bad days where I'm like what am I why am I working so hard or am I do what is what I'm doing really mattering and you know you have those questions now and then and it's so good to have a reminder just right there all in one spot so I love that you do that Hey everyone, real quick, I want to take a moment just to tell you a little bit about Clarity. Clarity is a powerful tool that allows you to organize, optimize, and update your blog content for maximum growth. One of the most powerful ways bloggers are using Clarity to make their content better is through the use of projects. You can think of projects as groupings of your content that need similar updates. They help you make data-driven task lists for each of your posts. Some popular projects that bloggers are currently running with Clarity are old posts that need to be no indexed or deleted, seasonal posts that need to be refreshed or pushed to social, full revamps for old posts, broken link fixes, posts to reshoot, adding alt text, and top posts health checks. 
Projects are at the heart of how bloggers are using Clarity to add extra value to their blog posts to maximize their traffic. If you are interested in checking out Clarity, head to clarity.com forward slash eat blog talk. Clarity is spelled with an I, C L A R I T I dot com forward slash eat blog talk to sign up for the waiting list and take advantage of their $25 a month forever plan. Go to clarity.com forward slash eat blog talk or check out the resources page on eat blog talk dot com forward slash resources. I feel like I might need to do some kind of collage for my office so that I can look up and see it. Yes. Or oh, that's, like that. that's a great yeah. idea. Oh, I love that. I might steal that from you. I need to get some glue out and scissors and do yeah. a craft project. Yeah, right. I mean, that's something you could hand off to kids, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> great. Right here, go at it. <laughs> So you mentioned like it really wasn't an easy process. It was hard. This was hard. So how hard? I mean, were you spending like, I'm just on the range, like five hours extra a week, 25 hours. How much time were you spending in the in the initial stages of doing this? Well, initially, so in January and February and March, actually, so at the start of the year, I basically stopped posting new content on the blog. Not stopped, that's not fair, but I went from kind of posting once or twice a week to once or twice a month and I used that time to do this. So that was a, you know, a big leap because obviously it's scary to not be putting new yeah. content on the blog. But what that did was that freed up, I don't know, maybe, you know, 10 or 15 hours. The other thing that I did is we all plan on updating our old content, don't we, and making it better. And I just saw this as a slight opportunity to do that. So I would, this is just my own technique, but I was just thinking, how can I make this work and get added benefit? So I would film a video and I would then re-photograph at the same time and then just refresh those photos. I'd got blog posts from, you know, five six years ago and I would use that as an opportunity to re-photograph those old posts so whilst I wasn't creating new full blog posts it allowed me to do a lot of updating at the time as well Mm. and then I guess I probably I maybe have spent an extra 10 hours a week I think because there was a lot of editing to start with and now that's a lot less because I'm so much quicker (laughs) and InShot is I mean as you've just said is really good I'm slightly torn because I don't like the idea of staring at my phone or, you know, for so many hours a day, but it it does also make it more accessible. So I don't have the answer to that one yet. (laughs) Yeah, that's okay. It's a work in progress, but yeah, so maybe. So after that initial kind of time when you had Mm -hmm. put all the hard work in, do things start getting easier? And why would you say they get easier? Is it because the algorithms get to know you better or favor you more? Or is it because you're just more in the groove or all of the above? Some of all of the above, but I think think the algorithms don't actually favor you. I think they just want you to do a good job, which is they want you to give people what they want. And if you're doing that, you'll just get the results. And I just, I, do you know what? I, I also often think about the hours I have spent worrying about the algorithm in the past. And I just don't even think about it anymore because I just think, you know, people are coming because I'm making the stuff they want. And that is a lot less stressful than trying to worry about how to, how to kind of win against the algorithm. And yeah, just the speed of editing gets a lot quicker. I'm a lot better at kind of batching content. So like I say, I'll do photos to update the blog as well. I'm also now a lot more organized with the content that I'm putting out. So I put out now an, a meal plan every two weeks. And that, so that will go on the Sunday. So there'll be a video of that. And then during the week, I'll put out five recipe videos and often those are already posts on my blog that I'm updating so that automatically gives me six days of content and then I do that twice in a month so that's 12 and so that's for me that's a really good way of scheduling because I'm already filling up half the month with content which essentially is updates yeah which also makes me feel organized knowing that I'm knowing exactly what's going out when and then I just keep really detailed lists I use Trello on my phone and on my desktop just of ideas that come to me all the time and things that people have asked for so yesterday when I asked my audience people asking for like recipes to cook with their children over the summer when they're off school you know to keep them busy 
And so I'll make, uh, you know, I'll wake up at, <laughs> I'll wake up at 6 a.m. Yeah. thinking about like a cookie recipe that I can do. And I just make a note so that when I come to scheduling those videos, I've got a list of ideas straight away and it's then a lot easier to kind of batch content and I have a filming day or two days and I film everything in one go and then like I say I edit through the week when I've got spare time so but those are all processes that have got so much easier by just like leaning into this as a content strategy it definitely wasn't like that (laughs) right no nothing ever starts out streamlined right and you start you have to start out somewhere and it's usually a mess when you start any new platform or new strategy but it sounds like what you're doing is just allowing it to evolve and kind of figuring out how it works into your life and Mm. how you can foster it while not giving your whole soul to the platform yeah exactly is there any piece of content or type of content I guess that you put on either Instagram or TikTok that you know is always going to be a hit (laughs) no not a specific type but the things that I find my audience so in the past as I said I used to try and do these like really clean professional hands in pans videos and the thing I have noticed that people absolutely love is just a bit a bit more reality so if there's a splash or a mess or things aren't quite perfect I think people love to see that in videos now and I would I would say that's a relatively recent thing in the last few months that I've noticed that and so yeah basically mess and the other thing that that does is it makes it a lot easier to film videos because you're ah. not trying to aim for perfection so leaning into that's also been really good for me in terms of time and yeah people love it people love to see a bit of reality yeah and also kind of I, I hate I'm not a big fan of the word hacks but I do use it but you know kind of just ideas that people haven't necessarily thought about as opposed to really detailed recipes. So just things that are just a really good idea with food and things maybe that as food bloggers we do without thinking about too much. So I did a video on TikTok which has had I don't know, like maybe two or three million views recently, which was, I don't know whether you've done it, but like uh, waffle cones, you know, ice cream cones. Oh, sure. And you put uh, like marshmallows and candy and stuff like that in the cone and then wrap them up and put them on your campfire. And they come out and they're kind of like s'mores, but all gooey inside the cone. And this is just a like, funny thing that I always do with my children. And they had some friends over and I said, oh, let's make a video of this. And people absolutely loved that video, which is just like a fun idea that I we've always done. So things like that, I think, make really good content at the moment, particularly. And for me, you know, they're not driving traffic to my site, but they're growing your profile as a whole and I definitely try and intersperse that content with my content that is serving the needs of my audience so it's just like a little sprinkling of extra stuff yeah that yeah that you just get a a feeling that this could be really like stop people scrolling this could be a reason why people stop scrolling when they discover me so I think it's good to have a mixture of that content as well and it's good to just experiment and see. I, I found, I've only been doing this for a week on TikTok, but I found that you kind of learn what people are yeah. looking based on like how fast you get numbers. My numbers are super small, but like on a few of the videos I posted, I'm like, oh, that was fast. Okay, that's what they like. And then you kind of yeah, do exactly. like the next thing and then you're inspired by something else in there. And it's a process. It's not something you can just sit down and figure out and like plan out. You've got exactly. to go through it, right? It's like a journey. And I think that comes back to like the key thing that I said at the start, which is just to listen to your audience. So even though on TikTok, you're not kind of asking them in the same way, you, what you've just said and what you're doing is the key thing. Just to be humble enough as well. Like in the past, yeah. I would have just thought, oh, I'm going to do this, this right. and this. Whereas now <laughs> I just kind of approach it and think, actually, you know, nobody, nobody yeah. wants that thing. What they want is something else. And if you can do that, I just think that's the key to it, just to watch what is working and experiment. The other thing I would say is the good, the really good thing about TikTok is I find it's just so much easier to gain traction as a new account. So if you've just started posting, you might have one or two videos and it, it's just so much easier to become really visible with those. And I think I had maybe one quite early on 
And that just really spurred me on. And I just thought, this is amazing. This has never happened to me on any other platform that you could just have one video become so big so quickly. And that's not necessarily always brilliant because you still need your those people that are following you to be the right audience. But it is a boost. You need a yeah, combination. Absolutely. Talking about TikTok specifically to start, I know that this is always changing, but I would love to get your thoughts on how often to post if you do want to create a huge following and then you know, an engaged following, hopefully, like how many times a week, a day do you recommend? I think it depends on your type of content. I follow lots of people who post multiple times a day. You know, I don't know if you've seen them, but kind of those food accounts where people are like cooking on screen, like almost live, you know, with their like yeah. with their face in it as well and chatting to camera. And that's a very different kind of account. It's a very different kind of content. I really like watching that, but I, it's not for me, I don't think, because I really like to have a set of time where I just film, edit it and then put them out. I don't want to really be filming every... I'm, I do not blow dry my hair enough to, <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs> to be on camera every day. So... I don't think there's a hard and fast answer. I think it has to be a balance between your life and what you're willing to give and what your audience want and respond to. So I couldn't commit to filming like eight videos a day like some people do. But then I guess if you're at home and you want to do that and you find it easier to just film chatty videos as you cook and your audience like that, well, that's great as well. But that's not right for me. So I do one video a day at the moment I very very rarely do more than that and I think I'll I will probably go down slightly in the summer and that's working really well for me I don't think there's a hard and fast rule but I just think it probably does need to be regular so I wouldn't go down to say less than three videos a week I guess okay just but if if you can only do three videos a week it's better to do three videos a week every week yeah than not do any. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And then what other changes in style, speaking about both Instagram and TikTok have happened recently and yeah, just any trends, changes that you can talk about? I think, so yeah, showing real life, showing some mess and slight chaos, I think people really like. I think a lot about stopping people scrolling in the first one second. So is the clip that I'm putting as the very first clip in InShot or however I'm editing, is it enough if you were scrolling through your phone to stop? And very often I've edited the whole video, get right to the end. And I just think, no, it's not enough. Oh. That wouldn't stop me scrolling. Yeah. So it's fine. I just like rejig it around. But again, it's about being humble enough to say, no, that, that's just not a good enough clip. And I also experiment with that. So sometimes I will put my face in and sometimes I will put like a really good shot of the food to start with. And occasionally I don't show the finished product at the beginning. And it's just experimenting and stuff like that with stuff like that to work out how to engage people. But certainly in that first one second, because we've all just got like such short attention spans haven't we so that would be definitely a tip for me to just think about that initial screen view that they see yeah and just and show some some reality however whatever that means to you whether it's the way you lay the food out or showing your face or showing mess or dropping something and (laughs) stuff like that people really like that I think the first video I posted on TikTok in my account was a day in the life of just being a podcast host. Oh, and yeah. And that's my most popular one. I mean, it's not even really? a thousand views, but it's more popular than ones that I posted in the past few days that I thought were really, really fun. So people really like that real stuff. They like seeing your real life exactly. and behind the scenes. They like seeing your mistakes and your messy hair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's good. Yeah, it's really good. It's a good way to connect to, to see that we're not just food. We are real life. Yeah, exactly. I like this trend that it's going in because for a while I felt like everything needed to be staged and perfect and polished and curated and your hair had to be absolutely like to the T and now it's Mm -hmm. kind of trending away from that, which I am completely embracing. I don't know about you, Sarah, but it's very refreshing. 
Yeah, I really like a bit of contrast. So sometimes I'll do a video and I've kind of, my hair looks nice and I've got my makeup on and I'll have my face in it. And then there'll be some kind of mistake or I drop uh, something and stuff. I quite like a bit of that. <laughs> I think that's really good. So that they people kind of think they're getting something really professional and then then they yes. realize. No. <laughs> I love contrast too. it's connection, too. isn't it? It's I, it like, is. Yeah. yeah. It's, it shows that we are all just doing our best in the kitchen. And I think that's... A really good, a really good thing to share yeah. because it's true. I love that. Any other changes? And also along with that question, how do we keep up with the changes? Because I feel like that's a full-time job in itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it helps if you enjoy the platforms. So I genuinely enjoy TikTok. You know, I have to remind myself to stop scrolling I think that's a really good thing and I think just what you and I talked about and what you just said about starting the way you have been posting and seeing what works just to really pay attention to the trends that like what stops you scrolling when you're scrolling what makes you follow someone what makes you click like on a video what makes you save it and just to be really kind of intentional about about noticing those things as you scroll whether it's on Instagram or TikTok I think that's really valuable I also I keep a notes section of things that I've really liked in videos or that I thought have worked really well so it might be I really liked that somebody did a side on shot for a burger or it might be that I really liked that someone solved a problem in a voiceover Mm. or Like I just keep notes of things that I notice as I scroll because by the time I have a filming day in a week's time, I wouldn't remember. So yeah, yeah, keeping notes and just being really conscious as you scroll to think about what has an impact on you. I I almost set aside time just to do that. I'm telling myself that I'm just just, just scrolling. But yeah, this is research and development. Yeah, 100% this is research. (laughs) This is not me just like watching funny videos about dogs. (laughs) But I think that's important. It is important to take that time to notice. I feel like you need to be a good consumer in order to be a good creator because otherwise you really have no idea. You don't know the platform well and you don't know what's working, at least in your perspective. So I think that's kind of step number one, which a lot of us resist because that's more time on our phone, more time away from the people around us. But really it is research and development. I mean, a lot of it can be. So it is like when I'm on my phone and I'm doing scrolling, I don't often do it for pleasure. I often do it just to see what's working. So my boys will say, mom, get off your phone. And I will say I'm working because I truly believe that I'm working. So now like every time I'm on my phone, they equate that with mom's working, which I kind of like. Not like mom is endlessly scrolling because she's a zombie. It's like true work. It's true research. I think that's really interesting. There's a, you're right. There's, and I think there's a big, if you can make a distinction in your life between, this is another, a whole nother podcast about how to not spend your whole life on your phone as a food blogger. But if you can make a distinction between mindless scrolling, which is what makes us all feel kind of a bit gross, isn't it? And actually thinking this is work. I, it makes me feel very different if I can kind of split that time up. And that's, that's, definitely helped me with doing all of this you know it's it's helped me not to feel that it's had a negative impact on my life so I know that this bit is work and then you know another time might not be another time might be dog videos on TikTok. <laughs> right I mean it is a mindset tweak that I think yeah. is kind of hard to overcome but it's a if you can nail that you can free up so so much space to just like not worry about that you know why yeah. why you're on your phone shouldn't be a worry and, and I know I've said it already but just for me because this has been working (laughs) and to have this shift into something really positive which is you know meeting people's needs helping people doing something that is genuinely making a difference to people suddenly that time spent on my phone it it doesn't feel like it feels fruitful it doesn't feel kind of like gross scrolling yeah because what the outcome of it is really positive and is really helpful to people so yeah it just it feels altogether good <laughs> yes right and it should you that's the ultimate goal right we want it to feel good yeah. we don't want to feel gross or icky exactly is, yeah you mentioned that you've grown your traffic your blog traffic from implementing this strategy in your business and growing your accounts 
Have you seen other things that have benefited your business as a whole? I mean, I don't do a huge amount or I don't do any at the moment sponsored work on Instagram because I have been doing other work that was kind of already booked in. But if I was doing that now and I what I will do next year is probably maybe plan on doing a little bit more of that. And obviously what I can charge there now got, you know, going from 60,000 followers to 160,000 will have changed significantly. So that will be a big change to my business. And that is a plan for next year, which is really positive, which is yeah. all around. Yeah, really good. Yeah. The other thing which I haven't mentioned is I've also repurposed these videos for the blog. So when I've recorded these videos for Instagram and TikTok, I then rotate them. So the horizontal upload them to the blog. And so all the time that's helping my ad revenue on the site mm. as well. So ah, that's a great little working tip. smarter. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Anytime I can repurpose, reuse, recycle yeah, my yeah. content. Oh, I love that feeling. I know. It's so it's great. Very satisfying. <laughs> This is inspiring. I knew this would be an inspiring conversation, but thank you for inspiring me and so many other people today, Sarah. Is there anything we've forgotten that you want to touch on before we say goodbye? I just want to say thank you to you, Megan, for the the podcast because it's inspired me so much and I've listened to it a lot this year when I was you know, really focusing on this stuff. And when you're at home typing away on your own, on your food blog, it's really lovely to hear a friendly voice and other people who are doing the same thing. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for saying that. (laughs) That made my day. No, it's really true. Is there anything else you wanted to mention or... Do you want my tip bit, my favorite quote or Let's my favorite it. thought? Yeah. <laughs> my I don't actually know where this comes from. I should have found that out, but I think a lot about 1% infinity and the concept of just improving a tiny bit each day to make these businesses better because it can be so when you're running a business where you essentially you can do everything, it can just be incredibly overwhelming knowing when to stop and just thinking reminding myself that if I just get a tiny bit better each day, who knows where I could end up in six months or a year. And that's been just incredibly helpful to me in the last six months and in the past years. So yeah, if you're feeling overwhelmed with starting any of this, or if if Megan, you're feeling overwhelmed with your TikTok videos, it's just 1% infinity. (laughs) You just do 1% tomorrow that's better than it was today. Who knows where you will end up on TikTok. (laughs) Oh, I appreciate that. I need that this week because it's like that honeymoon phase of doing it for a week is over. And yeah, now I'm like, oh my gosh, I do I really want to do this? <laughs> I have to commit here. Yeah. But yeah, I appreciate that. Those are very inspiring words to leave us with. So thank you, Sarah. And we will put together show notes for you. So any if anyone wants to go peek at those, you can go to eblogtalk.com forward slash taming twins. And I've been kind of stalking your Instagram page while we've been talking. <laughs> But everyone else should go check it out. But share with everyone listening where they can find you online, on social media, on TikTok, etc. So you can find me everywhere um, at Taming Twins. And the blog is tamingtwins.com. So yeah, on Instagram, just at Taming Twins and TikTok as well. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Sarah, so much for your time today. And thank you for listening today, food bloggers. I will see you in the next episode. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Eat Blog Talk. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd be so grateful if you posted it to your social media feed and stories. I will see you next time.